Hello, everyone, and welcome to Washington Football Team Salute to Service Connecting Generations event featuring Tuskegee Airmen, Brigadier General Charles McGee, Washington Football Team President Jason Wright, and Super Bowl winning quarterback and the current Vice President of Player Development of the Washington Football Team, Mr. Doug Williams. It is my honor to welcome you all to our panel discussion in honor of Salute to Service Month. We are excited to be hosting this alongside friends of the World War II Memorial today, and so glad that you are here joining us. Now, it's an honor to be hosting today's event, and for those of you that don't know me, hello, <laughs> I'm Janine Samuels. I am the current in-game host for the Washington football team and a former first lady of football for eight amazing seasons. I was a Pro Bowl cheerleader as well as a military appreciation tour performer where I had the opportunity to visit Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and a dozen in other countries in support of our military, just spreading a little joy and doing handshake tours across our world. Now, it is my honor now to introduce the man responsible for today's event, Alec LaCaraza. Hello, thank you so much for being here, Alec. How are you doing? I am doing well. Thank you so much, Janine. Janine, we are on the same bandwagon here. You're with me all the way through Salute to Service Month, so thank you for being our host today. Um, this is just one of many things that we are doing in preparation for our Salute to Service game coming up on November 8th against the Giants. We are hitting every, every not-for-profit organization, all of our major partners virtually um, throughout the week. We just had something with Wound Wounded Warrior Project and some of our rookies. We have a, a big Walter Reed, to uh, Walter Reed National Military Medical Center uh, tour in two weeks. A lot to come. A lot of things are going on and it is chaotic, but we are so excited to be supporting the troops any way that we can. Um, as many of the people watching today have been seeing on Salute to Service, uh, our Salute to Service uh, social platforms, we have been on 12 installations so far, feeding troops, uh, giving lunch out, and, and really just working our partnerships to support the military any way that we can while this pandemic is still going on. It's been a unique experience trying to engage with our service members, but we're still dedicated to the mission. And that's honoring, um, connecting, and empowering our, our service members and veterans. So this is just one of many things we're doing, but I'm so pleased to have our guests that we have on today. This is exciting. And none of this would be possible. I'll keep, I'll keep passing the, the good tidings <laughs> along um, to Holly with Friends of the World War II Memorial. Um, she has been fantastic. She helped us find 10 World War II veterans to bring to our suit to service game last year. This year, is a little bit different. So this is how we're engaging. This is how we're celebrating the 75th anniversary since World War II. Holly, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys have going on this year and, and some of your initiatives to celebrate? Sure. Thank you. So the Friends of the National World War II Memorial is actually was founded by the folks who built the World War II Memorial. And today we're dedicated to teaching the lessons of yesterday to unite the generations of tomorrow. And part of that, uh, the last four years has been commemorating the 75th anniversary of World War II. We were the only organization to host a full four year 75th anniversary commemoration marking every major battle in which the American troops took part more than 85 ceremonies over the last uh, four years. It's been a really busy four years, but it's been exciting to be able to bring to life the stories of the men and women who served our country under such extraordinary times. And I'm so proud that we were able to watch work with the National Football League and in particular the Washington football team over the last several years. Uh, we, as you mentioned, we worked together last year to bring 10 World War II veterans to your, to your field. And then we also worked to bring four 100-year-old World War II veterans to the Super Bowl earlier this year, including General McGee. So it's been such an honor and a pleasure, and we're so grateful to uh, the, the National Football League for helping to celebrate the 75th anniversary and these extraordinary men and women. Ditto, ditto, ditto. And, you know, I love being a part of an organization that helps make events like this happen. So thank you both. We really appreciate your support in making sure that we are able to have this discussion. 
So our panel discussion is not only in celebration, obviously, of Salute to Service Month, but a year in which the fight for equality and just addressing racism has never been more prevalent, both in our league, but also across our country. So we're so excited to hear about General McGree's um, illustrious military career and experience overcoming adversity uh, with his fellow aviators and how we can take those stories and use those as inspiration for ourselves and dealing with the difficulties that we face day in and day out. We're also super excited, of course, to connect him with two men that have paved and played a very pinnacle role in our league, breaking barriers and paving the way for so many people of color that will definitely be inspired and are inspired by both of them. So now let's go ahead and just get into the introductions of our panel. Not that these men really need a formal introduction. <laughs> But first up, our guest of honor, Brigadier General Charles McGee, is a retired American fighter pilot who was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen, an all-African American military pilot troop who fought during World War II. He was a career officer in the United States Air Force for more than 30 years and flew a three-war total of, get this, 409 combat missions in World War II, the Korean War, and the Vietnam War. He has one of the highest combat totals and longest active duty careers by any Air Force fighter pilot in our history. Also, my absolute honor to introduce Doug Williams. He is the current vice president of player development of the Washington football team and is most known for his performance with the Washington football team in Super Bowl 22 against the Denver Broncos, where he was named Super Bowl MVP after passing for 340 yards and four touchdowns, a single quarter Super Bowl record, which he set in the second quarter, making him the first black quarterback to both start and win a Super Bowl. And last but definitely not least, Jason Wright, who was recently named the first black president of an NFL team, and of course, here at the Washington football team. Now, before coming here, he played seven years in the NFL, originally signing as an undrafted free agent with the San Francisco 49ers in 2004, then made his way to the Atlanta Falcons, Cleveland Browns, and Arizona Cardinals. After retiring from the NFL, he graduated with the Master's Business of Administration degree in operations and finance from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Later, Jason became partner of the management consulting firm McKinsey and & Company, and now we are lucky to call him ours. <laughs> this is such an exciting event, so thank you. Thanks to all three of you for joining us today. I'm hoping that we'll be able to not only just hear about your backgrounds, but also your perspectives on addressing adversity and fighting for equality and just some of the parallels between the NFL and the military and what our teams and leagues can do better to not just talk about the change, but to literally be the change that so many of us are looking for. So I kind of just want to get this um, conversation started and would love for you all to interject and ask questions as well. I'd like to start with you, Mr. Um, Doug Williams. If you can just kick us off by telling us a little bit about your time playing with Washington, winning that Super Bowl championship, and just your overall pursuit of just becoming um, who you are today and being a front office executive after um, playing for us as well. Sure. sure. First, first of all, let, let me say this. This is a uh, start, starting morning for me uh, to be able to be on with uh, General McGee, number one. Um, it's, it's sure, surely a blessing. Uh, my dad actually uh, was in the Army and, and participated as one of the cleanup guys after World War II. So, you know, to sit here and, and, and be able to see um, Jerry McGee from an emotional standpoint, you know, kind of hit home for me. Uh, this is certainly a blessing. And I can't even imagine what is going on today compared to what he had to go through in order to be successful, you know, and, and, you know, today with all the, the climate and equality and injustice going on, you, you think we had bad. I can't even imagine what um, they had to go through with the Tuskegee Airmen I mean, to be who they are and be willing to fight for their country. You know, that's a strong mental personality to be able to stand up rather than say, throw in the towel and say, forget it. They made sure they understood that this was their country, too, and they went out and, and fought for it. Um, you know, what, what he was able to accomplish make what uh, I was able to accomplish 
small to me when, when, when you compare it. And I know a lot of people might not look at, look at it from that standpoint, but I do because, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a couple guys uh, like a Joe Gilliam and a James Harris to test the waters before I was able to be uh, an NFL quarterback, uh, you know, spend time in Tampa. But coming here, um, when I came to Washington in 1986, number one, I came in with some open arms. This city was, was good to me. But, but at the end of the day, when it came down for the Super Bowl, it went it reverted back to early years where because of the color of my skin, um, I wasn't going to be able, we, not I, but we weren't going to be able to win the Super Bowl because I was the quarterback. And, and you know, we was pitted against probably one of the greatest quarterbacks in NFL history, John Elway. So they didn't look at it from a, from a team standpoint. And I'm sure General, General McGee would look at it too. He wasn't alone. He had a team. He had a great team. And I was fortunate enough to be with a great team. So I took it from a different perspective. Uh, it wasn't Doug Williams, the black quarterback, that was going into the Super Bowl and, and looking to win the Super Bowl. It just happened to be the Washington Redskins with Doug Williams, who just happened to be black. And that's how I looked at it. So we went in there with a different mindset. But at the end of the day, nobody gave us credit because I was the quarterback. And, and lo and behold, fortunate. Uh, you know, we was able to come come through it and, and, and come out of victory and, and things like that. But, you know, this is the way the climate is today because, you know, sitting here and, and Jason coming into this organization, you know, I immediately thought about this organization from a standpoint of when it was first originated and the original owner who did not want African-American players to play for his football team. And I was fortunate enough as a player to be able to sit in the guy's office Every day, who was the first African American player to play on his team? Bobby Mitchell, bless his soul. And and you know you don't know what that done for me as in my position to be able to go on and have Bobby Mitchell to console me. You know because it was some tough times. You know I was in, I was out, and go in and just sit down and talk to him. And he was probably the one person that allowed me to stay strong and stay the course and and realize that eventually it's, it's going to work in your favor. So uh, my hat's off to Bobby Mitchell being the first um, player, uh, African-American player in this organization. And for me to be in the first black quarterback uh, in the organization, but also to be in the Super Bowl and be able to win it and to still be a part of this organization with them bringing in the first black president and in something that is missing across the league, not only in, in coaches and general managers, but uh, being one of the first black, being the first black uh, president in the NFL is almost unheard of. And uh, my my hats off to to Daniel Snyder, who had the guts, per se, to to make it happen. And you're talking about in the nation capital. I don't know if there a better place for all this to have taken place than than in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. in this area, D.M.V. Um, with that all said, you know, I, I still revert back to, to Jeremy McGee. Uh, this is a great morning for me, something I would never forget to be on online with, with you, Jeremy, to, to know what you accomplished and how you accomplished and one of the circumstances and the climate that you did it in. That was truly amazing, and, and I'll forever be grateful to be online with you, and I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. No, this, I, I feel the exact same way. It's such an honor to be talking to um, to all of you. I want to go back just to like what you're just saying. Um, was there something in particular that you heard from your father um, that really, you know, resonated with you and stuck with you that makes this moment so profound for you? Well, there's no question. You know, I, I grew up in South Louisiana, and uh, I tell people all the time, my hometown actually was 35 miles from the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, David Duke. Mm. So growing up, I saw crosses burn every Friday night. Uh, where, I, where I live, uh, on Plank Road, Highway 67, that ran from uh, Mississippi all the way into Baton Rouge. And uh, in between that, that was a crossroad. It was, mild, it was a mile apart. And in between the crossroad, it was just an all-black neighborhood. And we, we can almost bet. You didn't know exactly what time it was going to be 
but that was going to be crosses burned at each end of that those crossroads every Friday night, and it was amazing because all the all the fathers knew that it was going to happen, but it wasn't like they were sitting there waiting, but they they wanted to make sure that all their kids was off the street, they want to be out there. So we grew up under that that type of atmosphere. I can remember seven years old going from from Zachary, Louisiana, on my way to to Baton Rouge with my dad. And that was a small town in between Baker, Louisiana, and we stopped at a red light. And un unbelievable, a guy that was fully clothed with a hood and everything stopped and knocked on the window to pass out pamphlets of the Ku Klux Klan's. I mean, that's how bold it was back in the day growing up. And we grew up, up I'm sure today when I look back on it, um, and, and I'm kind of mad about it, but, but it was the best thing to do because it was, it was, it was a way of fear. It was fear because our parents was a fear for, for us for what has happened, you know, the Emmett Tills and things that happened to them. And, and I, I tell people all the time, this is the second coming of a civil rights movement as far as I'm concerned for what we saw during all the protests. You know, when I was growing up, I was able to see on television uh, the protests and how they put the dogs and the water and everything on the people that were protesting. And this protest was so much different from a standpoint of um, the diversity, the diversity of the people that was protesting. It wasn't a black protest. It was it was diverse. It was people of all race and ethnicity and everything that was out there. And I, and I just feel like this is a different time and a different movement for us. Hopefully, that America would look at it from that standpoint and realize that we're not going anywhere. Just like uh, General McGee's. For you know, his, for his age to still be here and stood for what he stood for and what he did during that time, you know, this is a fight for the soul. This is this is ours. You know, we we didn't we didn't come here. We were born here, and and I think at the end of the day, this is much as our country as is anybody else. And I think a lot of people recognize that when you saw all the protests that are going on. And and when I look back on the things that I went through. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to have gone through it and be able to see it and be able to talk about it, you know, and, and just like in my position now, I get an opportunity to talk to a, a lot of young African-American men who really don't understand and really never looked at it because it was so easy for them to get where they are today. They don't understand the price that was paid by General McGee. They don't understand the price that was paid from a sports standpoint of, of James Harris. Joe Gilliam and the Doug Williams and the Warren Moves of the world, but let me get that opportunity. Uh, you know, and you, you like to sit down and talk to them. You like to sit down and just, just let them ask questions like we're sitting here now. This, this, to me, like I say, this is a this is truly a opportunity to just to sit here and listen and be a part of it. And uh, But I look back now and, and realize that what I went through compared to what he went through and, and at the same time didn't know, didn't know it was as tough as it was because I was doing it. And my dad, one thing my dad always told us, it was five boys and three girls. It was a bunch of us. And athletics was at the, the four of our whole, our family. And the one thing he always told us was, what you wasn't going to do is quit. And, and what I did learn is one thing, anybody and everybody can quit. Everybody can't succeed. It's a little tougher succeeding than it is quit. And, and I remember when I was ninth grade and, one of my older brothers was, was baseball. I was a pitcher, and he was a catcher, and, and I felt like I wasn't getting into playing time. And I went to my dad, and I told him, I said, hey, dad, I ain't playing no more baseball. I'm quitting. And back then, it was a little different. You know, and they tell you, oh, hell, you're not quitting. <laughs> we don't quit in this family. <laughs> and, um, I, and I'm so glad to, to have had a dad to make sure that we didn't understand what quitting was all about. Yeah. Yeah. And I was fortunate enough, and, and in my family, you know, at I, I the six, at I, I, the eight that was in the family, seven of six of us graduated from college, and and to me that was that was big back then, because you know my dad and mom, I didn't see them in the morning when I got up to go to high school because they was going to work, and I was saw them six thirty seven o'clock at night when they came back from work. But we had a village, we had a neighborhood. I knew all the people around us. When I go home now, I sit down with my sister and them. You know, we talk about Mr. Ms. Jeanette and Mr. Will Gillum and Ms. Roach and Ms. Mary and Johnny Wall. All of them had, had the right to do whatever they wanted to do to us if they thought we were getting out of line. And God forbid if you did anything and they told your mom, my mom, bless her soul, her nickname was Shy. 
And he used to come over and say, hey, shot, I had to whip them boys today. And lo and behold, if they had to whip us, that's me, that's another whip. Because <laughs> what my mom always say, they should never have to whip you. So if they whip you, I know the reason for them to be whipped you. So, you know, I learned, uh, I came up in humble be beginnings. And, and I always looked at it from that standpoint. And I think that's one of the reasons why I am where I am today, because of the people, the parents that I had, my brothers, and the people around me. Most definitely. And, you know, just like you said, it, it does take a village. And uh, same way, grew up an athlete track and field. Um, and my dad would always say quitters never win and, you know, winners never quit. And so when you kind of live by that, that, that mindset, um, anything is possible. And I think the three of you have definitely proved that. So I'd love to kind of move the conversation um, over and just, you know, uh, Jason, if you don't mind, like talk a little bit about your background and your experiences as a player and how that experience and being an athlete has helped you to transition into your new role here with the Washington football team. Before I do that, I want to um, also just express how excited I am to be on here with General McGee <laughs> as well. Um, it is really an honor to be here, and it's, and it's quite personal um, for me as well, just like it is for Doug. My wife comes from an Air Force family. And, um, and the military and the intelligence community, the folks I consider the hidden heroes of, of our defense services were big clients of mine when I was at my last firm. And so it's a community I'm quite close to. But my wife's grandfather passed away in 2017, um, was uh, uh, one of the uh, navigators in the Air Force uh, in the Korean War and Vietnam War. His name was Lewis Braxton. And um, uh, he told his stories um, uh, about you know having the very maps as to where they were going to drop bombs in the Korean War, and then they would come back to base in Tokyo. So he was trusted with this secret that is very heavy thing. You know he's the one who said go when we needed to, you know actually you know attack the enemy. Um, uh, that is a very heavy thing and a, a, a national secret. And then to go back onto base and not be able to sit with his fellow airmen and to have to sleep with his family in a different area. The juxtaposition of that is mind blowing to me. And when I hear with General McGee, I recognize the strength of character that has to exist to hold those two things in tension, deep love and passion for your country while recognizing that that love is not fully reciprocated and still being able to deliver your duty with excellence and a smile and a firm chin in the face of the stuff you, that would come it makes like it, it blows my mind <laughs> and i'm a, and i'm and i'm a son of a black panther my dad's a black panther i'm the son of civil rights activist so i know some of these stories but this to me is one of the more remarkable ones and so anyway i'm just grateful to be on um it's actually hard for me to talk about my own experience in light of that because I feel like uh, no matter what challenges I faced or the good things I learned as a player about perseverance and failure and all of that stuff, I have had a very smooth path because of the General McGee's, the Doug Williams, my father, my cousin was one of the few female Black Panthers at the time. Um, my, my ancestor was a professor at Tuskegee who uh, took on the idea of racial gerrymandering in the Supreme Court, Charles Gomillion. Like all of these folks have made me landing here an easy slide. Um, and so it's hard for me to talk about that. And I am most interested in hearing from General McGee, but I'll say a couple things real quick to actually answer your question, Janine, so I don't mess it up. Um, I'd say the, the first thing um, that I've carried over from my time as a player um, is, is being able to be calm under pressure. I think uh, any former athlete at any level, um, you've experienced failure in a way that most people don't. You know, at my, at my last company, I had some of the most brilliant kids in the world coming out of college, and they, I don't think they ever got anything less than a B. And the first time I told them the math was wrong in their spreadsheet or they didn't do a good job in a meeting, you could see this crisis of confidence. <laughs> I think as a player, you, at least for me, I fumbled in front of 80,000 people. I'd been on Sports Center's Not Top 10, had people dog cussing my name in the stadium. You know, if... I have a disagreement with a fellow executive, I'm gonna be all right. 
I'm going to be all right. If I need to tell Dan that I think a different decision should be made than what he thinks, I can do that. I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that helps me. Um, I think the second thing that helps is um, when you know the game and you know the needs of the guys on the field, you can better make the business decisions that support them. And I'm trying to do that, whether it's investing in our practice field, working with Doug on something I'm very excited about and revamping our alumni program to bring everybody back closer to the team under Doug and Julie Jensen's leadership to make something really productive for us. Like I understand that stuff as a player. So that helps me. And then I think in this moment, it's less about being a player, but more about just being a black man in this moment is recognizing whether I like it or not, the gravity of being in a senior role like this and the importance of not putting my blackness on a shelf when I am making decisions, when I'm thinking about how I speak in the public, um, the way that I represent me and my family. Uh, and that's in, in critically important in this moment. And sitting here with Doug and General McGee, I take even more inspiration to do that more boldly. Yeah, and just so you know, um, it's already being noticed and it's already being felt within the organization. So we're obviously super excited to have you um, on board and just being willing to like hear the voice of um, everyone um, and not just you know the team members within the Washington football team but like you said the alumni but then also you know our supporters our fans and just making sure that the experience is amazing for everybody in the community um, so I appreciate you all sharing your stories and I know that we all want to hear the stories of General McGee so now I am coming to you sir um, today in USA Today, there is an article, and here is the title of the article. Imagine if Batman was your granddad. Unsung heroes, the Tuskegee Airmen, get the Lucasfilm treatment. Now, this is the same production company behind Star Wars, and they have just announced that they're going to launch an educational initiative celebrating Tuskegee Airmen because they really felt like your stories um, and those that you uh, were with have not, um, they've basically been lost in American history. And the documentary is called Double Victory, the Tuskegee Airmen at War, and you were actually quoted in this article. So first of all, congratulations. I think this is, an, is absolutely amazing. I cannot wait to watch it. But can you just share some of your experiences and some of the stories um, that resonate the most and that you vividly remember the most just as you were a Tuskegee Airman and the significant role that you feel you all played in World War II? Well, I appreciate the opportunity and I'm not sure I can, can, can fully answer that uh, question or, or follow all the way through, but but two things stand out in my mind as we as we look back. You know, the country had come out of ten years of depression when our leadership declared uh, willingness to support our allies in Europe against what Germany was doing, and it didn't change segregation, but doors of opportunity did open up a bit. To, the jobs to, to help support the war effort, the, the uh, opportunity to enlist and serve uh, in some capacity took to place. As I say, the change didn't change segregation, but there was an attitude of recognition of what our United States really uh, still hopes to stand for because this, the fight is still on. It's never over. And it's, it's like I say, if, if you give up hope, you're already lost. Uh, and, and so there's always a hope that, that tomorrow will be better, the hope that our youngsters will be, get on, on the right path. But that certainly gives us some responsibility to men, mentor our young folks along the way. And, and there's so many out there that need it and are not getting it, so we have a responsibility. But looking back, fortunately, the standards and ability of training didn't change, and we had good leadership. In other words, there were those, as I say, didn't change segregation, but believed in the opportunity and, and continued to assure that, that that didn't slip away. That's what we need to be doing today, be ensuring opportunity for our young folks. It doesn't slip away, and that's where hearing from folks 
in 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 this manner hopefully is a good step and we appreciate and thank you thank you thank you for that um so sometimes in the early parts of my career i i still don't have an answer to and I ask the question, I say, well, life's been a blessing. But I ask the question, why me? How me? I don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, somebody saw something that came from the training and, and how I was growing up that uh, allowed me to be receive assignments and, and do something that, that turned out to be on the right track. And, and I was also able to meet the requirements and, 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 and stand up. And that, that's it's hard to put your finger sometimes on that. Uh, I remember just being a little, um, well, treat other people like you want to be treated, period. Um, the old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but uh, words won't hurt me any, you know. Getting in a fight because somebody calls you some words doesn't solve the issue. <laughs> somebody goes away with a bloody nose or a black eye, but didn't change a thing. So it, it's it's our performance and our willingness to stand tall that, that 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 that's so important. And again, as I say, we had the leadership and those that uh, believed and were able to instill. As I say, instill in we sung young race second first lieutenants, what was the task? What's your goal? And that's why you're there. And I'm sure that's the same in the ball game or anything else. Why are we here? It's a team effort, not a single person. And and, and you put those things first. And then there you're guiding lights, if you will, as you move along uh, in the task. The other part of my career, and I don't have the full answer, I loved flying. My uh, Well, in ROTC, I learned to handle a rifle, but because I was in school, um, my draft board didn't pull, pull my number. Had they, I would have probably been on the ground with that rifle <laughs> in the mud, as I say. But I learned about the the flying opportunity, and I think my ROTC instructor probably pushed me to say, well, go take the pilot exam. <laughs> Excuse me. I did, passed it, got called in directly as a cadet, never went to boot camp. Uh, don't have an answer. Why? How did I miss boot camp? Most everybody else had, had to go, but it paid off. Uh, with the, the leadership that I had and my willingness to uh, do my best at the task assigned. And, and, and that certainly uh, pays off a, a, along their way. Uh, it's, it's amazing how you don't think about it at the time, but somebody is sees and mon maybe be monitoring and knows what, what you accomplished. And that pays off in the end because it's somebody up the line that gives you the promotion or gives you the chance to do a task that, that you're, you're ready for and, and, a, a, and able to accomplish a, a very, very, very important step for, 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 for sure. So, uh, Sometimes to have the answer to how things come about, it's, it, it's not always easy. And I tell folks that looking back, as I say, as a kid, uh, learning to treat other people like I wanted to be treated, uh, a few years later, a little, a little older, uh, I still still like the Scott Oath and the Scott 12 Scott Laws. But, but you know, to be able to say on my honor, you will do something and then live by it. That, that, that's hard to beat, and certainly something we can pass on to, to 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 young folks today. But as I say, the, the, for me, ending up in a career, enjoying what I was doing, not not the fighting, not the kill. In other words, when, when the Tuskegee Airmen went overseas, our 
when, and we began the escort work, we weren't there to uh, kill Germans, if you will. We were there to destroy their war-making potential. There is a difference. And I think that's also part of our attitude of how we treat others. White, black, Asiatic, different things. The source isn't important, but it's how we react and, and treat and look at, at, at the accomplishments, uh, the ability to share together in goals, um, uh, ability to mon monitor, uh, in other words, uh, we ended up accomplishing something. We weren't there thinking about civil rights, but what we accomplished was part of the ladder leading to civil rights. It takes other took other action uh, down the line to reach the top. But 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 you got your foot on the ladder and you do something to take a step higher, and that's that that's what was important. But with our training and our leadership, we were able to overcome the biases and generalizations and <clears throat> in some cases racist uh, ideas that because of our happenstance of birth, we didn't have the ability to do anything in a technical area. You know, that early study said, oh, physically qualified to participate in war mentally inferior, morally inferior, and everything else was said uh, so that, oh, dig ditches, cook food, drive trucks, fine. Fly and maintain an airplane, impossible. <laughs> you know, and what's interesting, <clears throat> when we look back on where life has taken us, the Army never changed the policy, but it is what we accomplished that stood out and allowed others coming along the way to say, this is the direction our country, how America should go. Fortunately, there were enough folks when the Air Force separated from the ground forces to take that step and <clears throat> help lead our country into a, a, the, a better regime, if you will, a recognition of all, not just some, not just those of this color or this race or ha ha happenstance. That's still still important today and something that that, that we, we we need to look at. But as I say, all in all, <clears throat> as I like to mentor and talk to young young folks, certainly perseverance is 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 a very, very key. We could have bowed our head and gone off and said, they're calling me names, they don't like me, and say I can't something and do nothing. What would our country be like today had that persisted? Um, so it's it's our responsibility, as, as I say now, as we look back, giving thanks for what we've accomplished and where we are and what, what it means, but being prepared to pass on the right words, the right uh, mentoring and so on for the young people who are out there because it's the young people who are our country's future. Certainly what we're doing today and now is important, has its place, but what that passes on to the young folks for the future is, is, is what's so very important and we, we can't overlook it. I appreciate the opportunity to share some, and I hope there will be some questions, perhaps, <laughs> yeah. down the line that, that can answer that, that I I haven't covered. So, but thanks for the opportunity to say a few words, and we look forward to still sharing. Yeah, no, I mean, we appreciate you sharing. There's so many um, gold nuggets in there that I literally wanted to like edit it and put like all of these little, oh my gosh, amazing <laughs> nuggets of advice. Um, and when I was just doing my research on you and all of your amazing accomplishments, um, one thing that I did see is that you're actively in the community, just like you said, talking to youth and sharing your stories and making sure that people understand, you know, where we were and where we are now and how to move forward successfully. And you talk a lot about the four P's. So can you just share um, with our our listeners about the four P's and, you know, even how you came up with this. Well, I'm not sure just talking to youngsters and 
and so on. Somewhere along the line, it finally clicked that uh, I could pass on, and and it's good for the youngsters, but also those who are mentoring the youngsters, and came up with perceive, prepare, perform, persevere, perceive, dream your dreams, time out what you like. That, that, that's so important. And I add, hopefully among your very many talents is something that you extremely enjoy doing. And I did flying. Prepare. Get a good education. And unfortunately, this goes beyond the individual because too many of our schools are not producing what, the, what they should. But learn to read, write, and speak well and develop those talents. Perform. Always do your best in whatever you're doing. That's the best for what's good and best for you is best for your family. What's best for family is best for community. That goes on up the line. And persevere. Don't let somebody tell you you can't do something or you cannot achieve. You can, if you believe, because we're all born with the what I call the greatest computer there is, our brain. But it's how we develop that brain and how we use it that's so important in daily life in our position in, in our country. Those are the four P's that I like to pass on and uh, there's some variations from it certainly that you can conceive but, but it's a good starting point <laughs> in the mentoring of our young folks. It's so powerful what you're saying. Can I jump in Janine? I, I mean I have yes. so many questions <laughs> Um, first of all, it's so powerful. I, I was taking notes and writing down the four P's, but you also there. There are these things you're saying that come from some of this, some some deep place. Like you you mentioned the the Scout Oath in Law, which I was I was an Eagle Scout, so immediately in my head, I was like trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. You know, like right, 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 like, right. right top of my head like you know i know and i and those things are are in me um but there's something deep in you where, where all this was formed there's a there's a sense of personal mission and purpose that doesn't actually depend on how other people treat you or the environment you're walking into it's steady it's constant you know where does that come from for me where did that come from is it from your parents is it from yeah where did that come from i i i, I would love to hear about that a little bit well, to me, my, my answer fully is, life is a blessing. But uh, I lost my mother. I was just over a year old. Uh, so it didn't have the guidance that, that a mother would be. And, and I've often sometimes thought that had my mother lived, what difference it would that may have made <clears throat> excuse me in my life and in in the choice in the opportunities uh, that, that 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 I received and, and and that's why to me I do say blessings come from many sources but certainly with the God of God and the the made this earth and and all that's in it if you will uh, and it's how we react in it and how we use use it that that's what what's so important. Hey, Jerry McGee, you, yes. you mentioned something earlier about you like flying, and that's that's understandable. But you wasn't just flying; you were flying for the United States of America. Yes. How, how was that a change from just lacking flying to doing something to protect America? I mean, was that different and been lacking it? And then all of a sudden you lacking it, plus you protecting America, so um, things in America? Well, from from early studies and so on, certain, you know, first of all, we're born here, so we're American, even though there are those that say, and you know, in my, my world travels, even though many places I've been around the world, everywhere else, for, for many years, I was Charles McGee coming down the plank here, old black. 
That's, you know, for so long, that was the first thing that here in America was seen. But, but it was the performance and opportunities and leaderships that I had and things that accomplished that helped change that, that attitude, if you will, of, of so many. And, and that's, that, to me, speaks to America's greatness. We're a long ways from where we can be, still be and still need to go. But like I said a little earlier, if we give up hope, you're lost. Right. So we can't give up hope. We must keep that in mind and, and do what will hopefully bring us to that, that place that we want, want, want our country to be and everybody in it to, to be a part of it. What I hear is so powerful is this faith in the American idea that it's that it's not just where we are now but the vision of what we can be and that's the root of your patriotism and your devotion to country is not just where we started or where we've come but what this idea of this free and democratic nation can be and I, I find that incredibly inspiring. I find it jarring and a good reminder in this moment of how we should think about our love for country. Um, uh, it, does, it's, it is a really powerful sentiment, and I'm, um, I'm floored by it. Well, and, and it's a track, as you mentioned a little earlier, what our grandparents, in some cases parents, went through tragic. But, but you don't get mad over that. You stay mad, but you don't let it show, if you, if you will, because that that doesn't help the situation. So it, it's how we, you know, the best word I can use right now is try to stand tall. Well, a lot of going on around you. Don't you let it blow you over. <laughs> you know, you say stand tall. You, you have stood tall. You're still standing tall because... Uh, this morning, you really stand tall for me, you know, okay. to have this opportunity just to listen and, and think about the Tuskegee Airmen who didn't get the credit that they deserved when they should have. Uh, and we're still looking for that, that, that attention that you all are so rightly deserve, not because that's what you were looking for, because that's what you deserve. And, and I, I think that's a blessing in itself. Well, and as you speak, what each of us do in the in the realm of work or activity that we're involved, how young people see that and how they're inspired is what's so important. And, and certainly that's another factor that helps keep us, if you will, going on the right track and not giving up and, and wanting to mentor the youth because we know what that means for them, their families, and their country's future. Yeah, and I just love, you know, this whole idea of standing tall, right, and, you know, moving forward and coming together. Um, you know, Doug, you had mentioned, you know, recently with the protests and the marches, it's, you know, it's so diverse and we are coming together. So I just want to kind of get you all's thoughts on this topic of, you know, inequality and making sure that we as individuals can foster change. And we don't have to be a General McGee or a Doug Williams or a Jason Ryan right, to have an impact because individuals, we can make a change as well. So just reflecting back on your experience and your life, we have, you know, generations here um, that are in front of me. What can just the regular person who is still so powerful, what can we do to ensure that we're constantly moving forward and that we are paving the way for generations to come? Well, I mean, I thought at all, you know, just like I said, sitting here talking to uh, Darren McGee uh, this morning, the way he has led is the way we have to lead. From a standpoint, in, in my profession as a, as a, a NFL player, as a quarterback, you know, one of the greatest things for me this year, and I'm not, I don't want to put economics into it, but this season was kicked off on a Thursday night with two of the highest paid players in the history of the National Football League, and both of them was African-American quarterbacks. To me, that's that have come a long way from where it used to be. And not only that, that season started with 10 black quarterbacks starting in the National Football League, which had come a long way. And that's the first week. The second week, we had eight 
African-American quarterback that played against each other. Mm-hmm. You know, the first time two African-American quarterbacks played together was, was in 1978, and that was me and Ben Simmons. That only <laughs> happened once back then, but now to see eight guys playing against each other in the National Football League, which means progress is being made, but we still got progress to go. And, and you know, that's in sports. But we're talking about in real life. I think I got to be able to take what, what happened to me in sports but put it out there in the real world about opportunity. And, and it's about quitting. It's about standing tall. You put it on and persevere. You put all that together. That's what, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's a fight that you got to fight. Uh, if you quit, you know when. And, and you mentioned that earlier. You got to keep fighting until to, to you can't fight anymore. You know, you sit here and uh, Martin Luther King gave his life fight for equality. John Lewis, oh, that's all they did all their life. And, not, and, and they went to their grave still fighting. And I think that's what we have to do as Americans looking for equality. If, it's not, if we don't get it, we're trying to make sure the people behind us, your family, your kids, have an opportunity to get what we didn't get. I think that's how we got to look at it. It's important there to realize that whatever you're doing, some youngsters watching. Right. And we need to keep that in mind as we go along and not let there be something that you wouldn't want them to do or think about or direction for them to go be a part of what you're doing. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Someone is always, always watching. You're a role model and you don't even realize it in every everyday life. Jason, were you getting ready to say something? Yeah, I was just, I, it, it, the points are so keen. And, you know, what comes into my mind when I think about you, General McGee, and you, Doug, is there's, there's two things that you all did. First and foremost, you were just excellent at what you did. You know, yes, you might be the only, the first, whatever it is. But your focus was, I'm going to be a great airman. I'm going to be a great quarterback. And you know, like my parents always used to say, you got to be twice as good if you're black. Like that's what I always used to say, you got to be twice <laughs> yeah. as good if you're black. I'm sure, that, I'm sure that's how it felt at your, at your stages as well. Um, and, but there was this thing that was a devotion to just being good at what you did and knowing there was a high bar. And then when you were excellent at what you did and you had a moment to speak about your experience, you spoke up. Mm-hmm. And those are the two things, I, maybe I'm oversimplifying it, but of me as a young guy in this role, I'm taking the inspiration to say, if I do my job with excellence, and then when I have the moment to speak up about that experience, I open my mouth and I'm truthful. That's the recipe that has allowed you all to have impact on society in ways that we see and even in the ways that we don't see. And maybe I'm oversimplifying, but that's what I'm taking from this. No, I don't think you're oversimplifying. It's so important to indeed carry on. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. And, you know, the name of this event is just Connecting Generations. And I feel like we have successfully done that. Um, and so if we could just one quick, I like literally don't even want to end this discussion, <laughs> but I know that I have to, <laughs> but really quick, just, you know, one or two sentences from each of you all um, for those that are listening, just as far as like moving forward, like based on your experiences, based on the things that you've been through, what's some advice for all of us to just continue to stand tall and to never quit and to keep moving forward? Well, you know, this not only helped me, hopefully to help anybody who listened to this, you know, number one, coming from, from Jeremy McGee, how he looked at it from the standpoint, and I always looked at it kind of like he looked at it. You know, we all could throw in the towel and walk back and say, I'm not going to do anything. What I'm hoping that the young people who, who listen to this realize that if you don't quit, that's a possibility that you're going to succeed. No matter what it is, it might not be what you want to succeed in. I'll be honest with you. I'm sitting here as a as an NFL uh, football player. That's that's not what I wanted to do when I was growing up. I didn't want no part of football. I thought it was going to be baseball. My old brother did the, the best thing in the world for me. He gave me an ultimatum. He told me I was going to either play football or whip him. So I ended up playing football. And for that, you know, going to college when I got there, Coach Rob, I was supposed to be on the baseball football scholarship, and Coach Rob say. Nah, you're going to play football. Baseball's in the spring. You won't be able to practice. So what I'm saying is about you might not do what you want to do, but if you keep going forward and don't quit, you might do something you enjoy doing or have done. 
<laughs> uh, I'll, I should say General McGee for last. I'll, I'll um, I guess I would say uh, deep love for country, support of our military, and the desire to see our nation evolve into a greater state of justice are not at odds with one another. They're all part of the same vision for the American idea. And that's what I'm taking away from today. I would add just to add that uh, it's so important to be prepared, but to realize that the steps along the way may not all be easy, but believe that you can, you got to believe in self, and as a, probably the key of all our discussion, as you see where you may want to go and where fit in their country, don't listen to those that tell you you can't accomplish. Look to the leadership of the area that you want to go and and, and as as I guess we would probably say, go for it. <laughs> in, in, indeed. Uh, there's, there's so much negative out there for the young folks, and and so if they can get their eye on the star, we need to help them reach it. Love it. What an amazing way to kind of wrap up today's discussion. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much, General McGee, Jason Wright, Doug Williams, um, for your time today, um, your thoughts, your inspiration. This has been an incredible discussion. Um, I want to just remind everyone to continue to have a deep love for our country. Um, be sure to check out all of the Washington Salute events and outreach initiatives that are leading into the Salute to Service game on Sunday, November 8th, where our Washington football team is taking on the New York Giant Giants. And last but not least, believe in yourself. Don't forget those four Ps, perceive, prepare, perform, persevere, never quit, and most importantly, stand tall. Thanks so much for being with us today. Bye. Thank you.